Bruchem Boim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, this week on my thought, I'd like to uh, discuss what is the worst sin that a person can commit. So this week on my thoughts, I'd like to discuss what the Torah considers to be the worst sin, again, that a person can transgress. I think that if you were to ask most people that, that question, the answer may well be uh, one who transgresses one of the, what we call, three cardinal sins. They are murder, sexual improprieties, and idol worship. Uh, these are all sins that the Torah commands us, that one must give up their life rather than transgress one of these prohibitions. What sin can be more serious than these three? So we end our morning prayer daily with six remembrances. These are based on the teaching of the Arizal, who was a great Kabbalist who lived in the 1500s in the city of Sfat, Israel. Uh, they are such as the going out of Egypt, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and the Shabbat. Another one of these remembrances is remember what the Lord God did to Miriam when the Jews left Egypt. What exactly do these words mean? Now these words are telling us that Miriam spoke lush and hara, tail-bearing, against her younger brother Moshe, and that God Almighty punished her with leprosy. There's no mention in the six remembrances of the six cardinal sins, pardon me, three cardinal sins, only the sin of Lush and Hara, of tail bearing. We also read in Tehillim, in Psalms 34, 13, where it poses the question, who is the man who desires life and loves days that he may see good? The next verse answers that question. It states, Guard your tongue from evil. You know, the Mishnah in the Tractate of Orchid tells us that one who speaks evil with their mouth has committed a more severe transgression than one who performs an evil deed with their body. In addition, our sages tell us that when you speak lush and hara about another individual, you gift them all of your mitzvot, good deeds, and in return, you receive all of their averos, all their transgressions. So let us first define what the Torah considers to be Lashon Hara. So Lashon Hara is defined as slander or tail-bearing, saying things about other people that can cause them pain or embarrassment. A person transgresses this prohibition, interestingly enough, whether they speak about it or even if they listen to it. When the children of Israel in the desert, they failed many of the tests that God Almighty presented them with. In fact, they even made the golden calf. Yet we see that God Almighty forgave them time and time again. However, when the spies spoke lush and hara about God and the land, then the people accepted and the people accepted their evil report and they cried over it in their tents. Well, with that, they sealed their fate. It was the sin of the spies, not the making of the golden calf, that brought about death to the nation and caused them to travel in the desert for forty years. Rather, than entering the land shortly, according to God's original plan. So what is there about this sin of Lush and Hara that makes it the worst sin of all? The Chafas Chaim tells us that when a person speaks Lush and Hara, they can transgress 31 mitzvot in the Torah. 17 of them are negative, and 14 positive commandments. Think of it. If a religion person were eating a sandwich and someone informed them that the meat in the sandwich that they were eating was pork, not only would they spit out the food in their mouth immediately, in addition, they would thank the person who informed them of their mistake. You know, however, if an observant person was speaking Lush and Hara, huh, and someone else corrected them for doing so, they would have many responses as to why they weren't really transgressing the prohibition at all. The most common response is, but it is true. Some people don't realize that that is exactly what Lush and Hora is. When someone is telling lies about another person, that is another sin completely. The worst part of this scenario is that we have become so accustomed to speaking Lush and Hora that we never even feel any remorse. We never do any true tshuva. We just keep on talking. And in reality, it becomes a perfect sin something difficult to reach. Now, the answer to our question can be found in the teachings of Kabbalah, Mida Kenegibida, Mida, measure for measure. 
What does this mean? There is a saying in Judaism that goes, Al tiftach pel the sun, which means do not open your mouth to the sun. The sun is again the devil. Why are we warned about speaking more than any on anything else? So our sages tell us that the sun is blind and mute, but he does have the ability to hear. You know, the reason why we sin is that we think that no one is looking. I often tell my students that if I were to give you a 10-year-old boy to be at your side every minute of the day, well, guess what? You would be at tzaddik for that day, all because of a 10-year-old boy. You know, we all believe in God and that he is everywhere, yet somehow we still have the ability to sin. So it is with our transgressions that we give the Sutton the power of sight. Then with the vision that we give him, he is able to see our sins. The Sutton is then described as being filled with eyes. Though he may have the evidence to prosecute us, you see, he cannot accuse us before the heavenly court. He has a problem. The Sutton doesn't have a mouth. He therefore does not have the ability to bring charges against us before the heavenly court. However, once we speak Lashon Hara, we now give him, the Sutton, the prosecuting attorney, the power of speech. This enables him to bring charges against us before the heavenly court. The court then examines the records of three people. The person who spoke Lashon Hara, the person who listened to the Lashon Hara, and even the person of whom the Lashon Hara was spoken about. So what we see is that if a person does not speak about others, then they cannot be charged before the court. He cannot be prosecuted. His sins will be dealt with by his Father in heaven, privately, in any way that God Almighty sees fit, which is always with the attributes of kindness and mercy. He does so in the hope that the person will repent and not have to face retribution. You know, we are told by our sages that God's greatest trait is called erachapayim, which translates to mean slow to anger. God, as our benevolent Father, does not want to destroy the sinner. He just wants to destroy the sin. However, once a person's record is brought before the heavenly court, our Father in heaven does not interfere with the due process. The persons, persons involved are judged with strict judgment, which the court must adhere to. Therefore, the verdict is much harsher and the punishment more severe. Why is it so important for the Sutton to prosecute us? Well, it goes back to the story of the Nachash, the snake in the Garden of Eden. It was he who was culpable of the first recorded conversation in history of Lashon Hara. The snake spoke Lashon Hara about God to Chava, the first woman. Uh, she listened to his words and ate from the fruit of the tree that they were forbidden to eat from. Before the sin of eating from the tree, evil existed in the form of the snake. It was an independent entity, something that you could easily avoid. It was sustained by God Almighty, much like everything else that he created. However, once man ate from the tree of knowledge, then he internalized evil. Evil then became a part of his subconscious. After the sin, the snake's sustenance was dependent on the sins that a person in which he resided would transgress. The side of evil gained the advantage of knowing our weaknesses even better than we do ourselves. In reality, without what we call siyata deshmaya, without the help of heaven, there is no way that we could ever succeed against our evil inclination. Though a person may sin, the Sutton was not given permission to derive any nourishment from their misdeeds. He was first required to accuse that person before the heavenly court. Only then could the Sutton receive his sustenance. If a person doesn't speak Lashon Hara, well, the Sutton, who is a mute, does not have the power of speech to accuse him. So even though the person may have many sins on his record, he will not receive a summons from the heavenly court. In some ways, the heavenly court and the earthly court really mirror one another. You know, I'm in the restaurant business. Some years ago, I discovered that a cashier stole some money from me. I witnessed her on video stealing $200 from a cash register. 
I notified the police station and I said that I had proof of her theft. I said that I wanted to prosecute her. They informed me that they would take down all the information but that they would put it on file. However, they would not take any legal action against her at that moment. If and when she would be charged in the future for any other crime, only then would the court prosecute her for stealing from my business. If she was never charged with any other crimes, well, then she would never be charged with the theft of stealing from me. It would just be my loss. So beginning with the snake in the garden, Lush and Hara, has been a stumbling block which mankind has constantly transgressed. And we read in the Torah that Yosef was sold into slavery because he spoke Lush and Hara about his brothers. His father, Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, who listened to Yosef's tales, suffered along with his favorite son for 22 years. The children of Israel have been plagued with the sin of Lush and Hara throughout their history. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, even he spoke Lush and Hara about the nation and he was stricken with leprosy. Both Aaron and Miriam were reprimanded by God with leprosy when they spoke Lush and Hara about Moshe, their brother. This led to the incident with the spies. One may question, why, what do these two occurrences have in common? So the Isnaim Latura stated that until Miriam spoke about the fact that Moshe had separated herself, himself from his wife, Moshe's staunchest supporters were the righteous women of that generation. They would not allow their husbands to rebel against Moshe. However, when they heard that he had separated from his wife, hmm, they feared that their husbands would follow his example and separate from them also. So because of Miriam's lush and hara, Moshe lost the unconditional support of the women of that generation. This allowed those men who wanted to rebel against Moshe to demand that he send spies to check out the land. The women were no longer there to protect him. Then after the incident with the spies, Korach and his followers chose to speak lush and hara about Moshe and Aaron. They thought that the time was ripe for a rebellion. Well, they paid dearly with their lives. The first temple was destroyed because of the sin of Lush and Hara. The Talmud in the Durham relates the story of King Tzitzkiah, who told Lush and Hara about the king Nebuchadnezzar. With his words, he brought about his own destruction and that of the nation. During the Second Temple era, the Romans were invited into the country because of the Lush and Hara that exists between two brothers, Aristobulus the second and his son John Hyrcanus the second. Both brothers were vying for the throne. This action laid the seed for the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. In the whole story of Purim, which occurred at a very unique time in Jewish history, it was the only time when all the Jews that were in exile lived under the rule of one monarch. The threat of total annihilation can be connected to many different reasons. However, I believe that the root cause of Haman's decision to kill out all the Jews can be traced back to one word written in the story told to us in the Megillah Tester. In chapter 3, it states that Haman was elevated to the position of a viceroy, and everyone was ordered to bow down before him. Mordechai the Jew did not bow. But in relating the story, the narrative tells us that Haman may not have noticed that Mordechai didn't buy, bow, or he may well have thought that Mordechai, who was a minister to the king, would thereby be exempt. But either way, he did not make anything of it. That is until chapter 3, verse number 4, which states, by Yagidu, that others told him. Once other people told him that Mordechai didn't bow down, huh, Lush and Hara, then Haman's ego took control and he wanted revenge against Mordechai and all of his people. Again, Lashon Hara. Now what I find interesting is that the Torah states that a person who speaks Lashon Hara is punished, is punished with leprosy. There are two portions in the Torah, Sazria and Metzora, that deal with the sin and also the cure. One would have to realize that in earlier times people must have been very careful about speaking about others. The proof would be that otherwise leprosy would have been viewed as a pandemic. 
So the question becomes, when did God stop administering this punishment of leprosy, the physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency? Our sages tell us, when the sin became too prevalent in Israel. Imagine, if everyone today who spoke lush and hard were to be afflicted with leprosy, the end result would be that the look of a leper would become the norm, and what would have been normal before now would become repulsive. Those righteous individuals who would not speak Lush and Hara would suffer. So God Almighty had little choice but to remove the punishment of spiritual leprosy from this world. So the whole concept of leprosy is unique in that God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven, created the spiritual disease of leprosy since he was concerned that speaking Lush and Hara about other people would become habitual. As we learn from the past, it has the power to destroy not only people and their inner relationships, it can even destroy whole nations, and we should never know from it, but even our world today, God forbid. We live in an age where Lush and Hara is the norm, not the exception. We are in a world of communication, cell phones, computers, satellites, and global internet, Everything, everything moving faster and faster. The world has turned into a neighborhood. Somehow people want to know what's going on in other people's lives. Lush and Hara. Gossip reigns supreme. With a cell phone or computer, you can listen to and spread whatever information that you want. Sometimes it may be information that you don't want others to know, but once it's on the internet, it's too late to retract. Kabbalah refers to man as a medaber, meaning one who speaks. What difference, pardon me, what differentiates us from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to speak. The gift of speech, like any other power, can be used for good or it can be used for evil. It can create lifelong friendships or it can divide even the closest of relationships. We always need to remember that once a word is spoken, it cannot be taken back. It remains lost forever. They tell a story about a man who had spoken Lush and Hara about another individual. And so we went to a rabbi and asked him how he could do tshuva, repent for his speech, speech, since the person he had spoken about had moved away. The rabbi said to him, what he should do is he should go home and take a feather down pillow and open it up. He should then lay a path of feathers from his house to the rabbi's. After that, he should turn around and retrieve all the feathers and put them back into the pillowcase and then he would be forgiven. The man said, great. <laughs> he went home, took a pillowcase with feathers, opened it, and began to lay a path from his house. When he reached the rabbi's house, he turned around to retrieve the feathers, but to his dismay, the wind had blown all the feathers in different directions. It was impossible to collect even a small amount of feathers. He quickly went to see the rabbi. He was concerned. He told the rabbi there was no way that he could retrieve all the feathers. The rabbi shook his head and said, exactly. Once words have left your mouth, there is no way of putting them back in. True, we can say that we are sorry. However, true forgiveness belongs basically to God Almighty, our beloved Father in Heaven. People, on the other hand, well, they may say that they forgive. However, more often than not, they file. They do not forget. True and complete forgiveness, more often than not, comes only from a parent. This is why we turn to God for our forgiveness, since He is our Father in Heaven. Not only does He forgive our transgression completely, He even allows us the opportunity to change the misdeed that we performed, the sin, into a mitzvah, a good deed. What we refer to as tshuva me'ava, repentance out of love. So let us be cognizant of who and what we talk about. Let us do as this day some Pirkei Avot. Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia said, Havadon es kol ha'adam l'kav Judge every person favorably. You know, in the Hebrew text, the word kol is added, which means all. This one word adds a great deal to the understanding of this statement. Now, if you were to remove the word kol from this statement, you would translate the phrase exactly the same way. So the word kol, all, tells us that we should not judge a person based on one isolated 
incident or one character flaw. We should judge a person in the context of their entire being and all of your previous encounters. When you look at all of the person, more often than not, times that are the exception are no longer an issue. So let us all try to use our gift of speech for making ourselves better people. Let us reach out to others with words of love and encouragement. Then we can hopefully turn the lush and hard, the evil speech, into lush and tov, pleasant, positive, and proper speech. Only then will we be able to live in peace and prosperity rather than war and destruction. So let us all pray for a quick and decisive victory in Gaza with the complete destruction of Hamas and all the evil in the world. May God Almighty bring home the hostages safely, cure the sick and injured, comfort the mourners, and bring home our brave IDF soldiers led by Mashiach Tsukeno quickly and in our time, and let it be now. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with all that's good. Be safe, be healthy, be happy. Again, please, if you haven't, uh, subscribe, push the like button, and please share it with your friends. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom. There will be a musical rendition after this class. Please stand by. Thank you and be well.